Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Pastor. We bring you greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Indeed, it is good to be your guest here in the <coughs> beautiful state of Connecticut. I don't know if you all know this about this beautiful state, but in its original constitution, it had a provision that when a new village was established, the first building must be built. It would have to be a church building. Not all the church, not all the states had that provision in their constitution, but this state did, Connecticut. So we know that the fathers who found it were Christians. They required that as, uh, as the village was built, the first building must be a church building. Praise the Lord. We want to talk to you tonight about a great miracle, a miracle that God worked in my life, not because of me, but in spite of me. I was in an ambulance being transferred between hospitals as a result of a massive internal hemorrhage when all my vital life signs failed. The paramedic in attendance judged me to be dead. Up until that very day in my life, I had never experienced any kind of supernatural activity. I had never heard a supernatural audible voice. I had never seen any kind of supernatural manifestation. In fact, theologically speaking, I did not even believe such thing was possible. So I was probably the poorest candidate in all the world for what God was going to do that day. He certainly did not do it because of me. He did it in spite of me. So I want to tell you the message that we have today, no man gave to me. It was not developed as a result of some theological training or upbringing, but rather I like to say that I have a personal message from God himself to one generation of time, yours, and he sent it from the other side of the grave. I, before I start, I'd like to read some scripture found in Matthew chapter 13, uh, excuse me, chapter 7, beginning at verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, narrow the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Then at verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. The Bible clearly tells us not to believe every spirit, but try them. For many false spirits are gone into the world. I start this testimony tonight with that same challenge to you. I ask before you judge what you hear tonight, hear it all, and then try it. Try it by this Bible, which is the Word of God. Place on the side your own uh, theological convictions, because I had one hard time trying to overcome my own theology when this experience was given to me. I ask you to try by the Spirit. And if I tell you one thing that you cannot find in this Bible or support in this Bible for it, then you don't believe anything I say here. Throw it all out. But if this Bible will support even the most bizarre of the claims I make here tonight, then I ask you to please give it your honest consideration. Consider what you hear here tonight. To begin my story, I'm, I'm going to have to go back and tell you about some of my own personal past history. Now, not because of me. God didn't do this because of me. But in order for you to understand the depth of the miracle itself, you're going to know a little bit about my own personal and physical condition, condition the day that Jesus visited me in an ambulance. To begin this, I need to go where it started in my life. It started on the 24th day of November, 1928. This coming November will be 60, 81 years ago. I like to tell people, however, I'm only 31. It's just the knees that are 81, you know. 
So <clears throat> it all started the day I was born. I was the seventh living child born into a family of eight children. We were a very poor family. We resided in a very poor section of the nation. 1928 was the beginning of the Great Depression down home, the hardest times in the history of this land. People struggled all over this nation just to put the daily bread on the table. I know my parents did, but as I look back in retrospect, I realized how blessed I was. You see, I was blessed because I was born into a Christian family. And because my parents were Christian, they never talked about the great struggle they were having, not in front of the children. So at the time, we were so very, very poor. I didn't know we was poor. At the time, we were struggling so hard to live. I didn't know it was, we were struggling because they never talked about this in front of the children. And at our house, when it come time to eat, it always seemed that we had food on the table. Of course, it wasn't the best, but that didn't bother me because I didn't know what the best was. <laughs> and when it came time to wear clothes, it always seemed that I had clothes to wear to school. Didn't matter to me that Mama made those clothes. Most of them she made from recycled seed and fertilized sacks. They were still clothes. Growing up in the toughest times of the history of this nation, living in a rural area where our closest neighbor was two miles down the road, we never knew what was going on in his house because we didn't have a telephone to call him up with. Even if we would, he wouldn't have had one to answer us with. <laughs> Country people didn't have telephones in those days. Electricity never came to the rural south till 1940. Did you know that? It didn't come to the south till 1940 when they passed a rural electrical, uh, Congress passed an act forcing uh, those uh, co-ops co into business which uh, brought electricity into the rural south. Up until that time as school children, we, we, we did our homework by the light of a kerosene lamp. My mama cooked three meals a day on a wood-burning stove to feed 10 hungry mouths. And, and she didn't even have a can opener. She didn't even have a can. You know, that's the way it was growing up in the Great Depression. We never had, I think there was, wasn't more than one or two automobiles in the entire community. And, you know, uh, uh, television had never been invented. And uh, radio was uh, about the size of this and the runoff of an old dry cell battery. And it cost so much money to buy that battery, and people didn't have money in those days. So we were, we were blessed to have a radio, but we just set it in the corner and looked at it. If you turn it on, it'd run the battery down, you know. <laughs> so <clears throat> you just didn't have enough money to buy it. So we was living in a, a closed-in world, so to speak. We didn't know what was going on in the rest of the world because the uh, avenues of communication was not at all like it was today. And rarely did a stranger come into the community. So when he did, it was like a parade. Everybody came out to see who he was, you know. Uh, just uh, during the week, we didn't go anywhere. And somebody said, what in the world did you do to keep from being bored to death? You know, I never spent a bored day in my entire life. Not a single one. My father was firmly convinced that the idle mind was a devil's workshop. And nobody at our house ever had an idle mind. We never had time. All of our time was budgeted into chores. And the last chore of the day, after the evening meal was done and the dishes was clean and put away, we had to gather into the living room. And there, Papa, as we called him, took down the good book. This was our radio. This was our television. This was for our education, our edification, whatever you want to call it. We had to have our daily dose of the Bible where we needed it or not. And that's where I learned first all about these Bible heroes. And then on Sunday, we went to church. Everybody went to church in those days. It wasn't a problem to go to church. See, during the week, you didn't go anywhere. Sunday was one day you were going somewhere. So we were out early in the morning going to the church. We had a little routine at our little country church. It was, we would get there two and three hours before church time. The adults would meet out front and catch up on their socializing. We'd call that back fence gossiping today. The little girls would go around the back and play, and little boys would go down the woods to play. And when it was time to come in, they'd ring a church bell, and we all had to come in. 